my favorite books are often things that um, don't take sides so much as sort of take issue with normal lineups. It's really saying that left or right are not terribly good ways of looking at things. You don't have to look at things through funny spectacles. You can take your, spec take your left and right spectacle lens off and see things as they are. I'm here with Sir Samuel Britton, who is retiring after a distinguished career of more than 50 years at the Financial Times. Samuel, yes. you grew up in London. Yes. Uh, your father was a doctor, Correct. but politics and economics was very much the stuff of conversation. Did you ever imagine that you'd be the first economics correspondent of the Financial Times? It would not have astonished me. My interest then and later was, not, was politics, but I knew I wouldn't be a politician. And economics uh, appealed to me, not because of business, but because it was the one bit of politics from which one could earn a living without standing for Parliament. But you also thought of becoming a psychiatrist. No, psychologist. And not one person in a hundred knows the difference between them. Uh, you'll explain, of course. Yes, well, a psychiatrist is a doctor of the mind. A psychologist is a scientist who tries to investigate how people think uh, and mistakes they make. I stand corrected, Samuel. <laughs> uh, at Cambridge, you attended lectures by Milton Friedman. What was he like? Oh, he was a charming person. Uh, but it had to be, uh, at first I didn't like the idea of being taught by a far-out Republican. But uh, I actually learned a lot from him. But I learned most, not when I was sitting in a room with him, but years afterwards, when some of his ideas came back to me. And what was your political inclination at the time, in this immediate post-war period? My political inclination had always been the same. Some of the de details have changed. I've always been a sort of individualist liberal. A militant moderate? Militant moderate, yes. But uh, individualist liberal is more precise. I stand corrected again, <laughs> Samuel. <laughs> you also, uh, did you not apply for a job at Shell? Well, of course, when you leave university, you go to see the appointments board and they send you to a few people and Shell was one of them. I didn't know how seriously I expected to be taken on or, and I certainly didn't think they took me very seriously. I can't quite imagine seeing you in shorts in Nigeria. That's exactly what they said. Well, they obviously had good judgment. Sam, you <laughs> met uh, the distinguished, probably the most distinguished, editor of the Financial Times, Sir Gordon Newton, yes. for your first interview. What was he like? Well, he was a paradox, really, because journalists are supposed to be very articulate. And he was the reverse. And uh, you, you got on better with him if you didn't expect him to say too much. And he was a man of few words. And he was a man of few words. It was very odd for David. But he was a man of few words. But you knew if he liked something or if he didn't like something. And he wasn't always technically just. I mean, he might dislike an article, and what he really disliked was a previous article. In a sentence, what made him a great editor? Instinct. That's it's a, a word, word, not a, a sentence, word. but we'll forgive you. <laughs> Sam, you, you, it's true that you once wrote an illustrated feature about the economics of an egg. Yes, and Gordon Newton was very keen on it, too. Uh, but I remember uh, speaking to the egg industry. The people in it were all saying things like it varied so much. And that didn't satisfy Newton at all. What he wanted was a sliced up egg with so much for feeding stuff, so much for workers who looked after the hens and so on. Uh, today we'd call that obviously a deconstructed egg. Yes. <laughs> uh, but you were made the uh, newspaper's first economics correspondent yes. in 1960. Yes. Um, what kind of stories did you cover then? Well, the same as I would be now if I did more news stories, that uh, what's in the next budget, why. It was a little less international than it would be today. Sam, you've written uh, about and witnessed firsthand all of the major political events of yes. the last 50 and more years. Uh, including the devaluation of the pound, yes. obviously the exit um, of the pound from uh, the exchange yeah, rate yeah. mechanism, uh, and the Bank of England gaining independence. Uh, which economic events do you believe had the biggest impact 
on shaping the UK as it is today? Well, can I answer a question in two parts? The most dramatic episode was a devaluation. And Harold Wilson, the Labour Prime Minister, had a Boy Scout attitude to the pound, and he thought it would be devalued over his dead body. But it was devalued, and he lived a good few years afterwards. And you also uh, were uh, very influenced uh, by the events in 1992 with the exit of the pound, because you supported the pound's membership of the ERA. I, I did, yes. And I, well, I thought we needed some kind of discipline, but we've, we've now got it through an inflation target, an independent Bank of England, and all sorts of subtle interacting mechanisms. And was that one of the rare cases that Samuel Britton and the Financial Times got it wrong? Uh, well, I'm not sure, because I don't think the uh, exchange rate mechanism had to be run as badly as it has been. Sam, you said Reginald Maudlin was one of the few economically literate chancellors. Yes. Who else falls into that category? Well, Nigel Lawson and uh, to uh, some extent, what was the name? Norman Lamont to some extent. And of course, going, going back a, a few years before then, Hugh Gates, well, nobody would dare call him economically illiterate. And what about George Osborne? I, I believe he doesn't even have a degree in economics. Well, I don't hold that against him. <laughs> Where would you rate George Osborne in the pantheon of post-war chancellors? It's too early to say, but I think his record might be better than his pronouncements. Why would that be, Sam? Well, because he might be, he might be one of these people who does the right thing without knowing why. Um, if you then had to look back over the last 50 years, what was the most uh, important political event? Well, as this is the Financial Times, I'd have to say it was the devaluation of Sterling in 19... When was it? 1967. It was never going to happen. It was going to happen over the dead body of the Prime Minister. Now, it was significant because that removed the taboo on thinking about the exchange rate. Were you also very influenced and by the events in Suez, widely seen as the moment when Britain uh, lost its status as a great power? Well, I think it had lost it before. But in 1945? Yes, but Suez, and in fact, in 1940, I have some memories of 45 as a precocious child. Some of my family friends were Central Europeans, and they didn't always appreciate how Britain had saved their lives, and they kind of imitate their accents. They used to say things like, England is finished. And that was quite long before the Suez confirmed it. Sam, if we go back to your political outlook, uh, yeah. you wrote a very influential book uh, in 1968 called Left or Right, The Bogus Dilemma. It's my favorite well, book. Why? Well, because asking, uh, whether some position or person is left or right is the least interesting thing about, about him. And that, uh, most of the interesting questions don't, cannot easily be posed in left-right terms. Uh, I mean, uh, leftists want to equalize everything which will happen in heaven or hell, and rightists are too incurious. Perhaps your book anticipated Tony Blair and the Third Way. May I be forgiven? <laughs> <laughs> I've done nothing against Tony Blair, but Tony Blair was no kind of theorist. There is no kind of theorist. Do you believe that there is a, a sensible divide between left and right today? Or have the boundaries been fundamentally withdrawn I think after that, the fall of communism? There is some kind of difference. I mean, the, the, um, I mean Ed Miliband is to some extent to the left of George Osborne, but I don't think that that's the most interesting thing to say about people. I mean, I'm not really interested whether you call yourself left or right. Sam, what do you think, where do you think Ed Miliband stands? And are you impressed by him as a political leader? No. His brother would have been much better. And it's a bit embarrassing because I've got a brother too, but I think David would have been much better. And I can't remember the peculiar voting structure that led to his election. I think if it had been left to the parliamentary party, David Miliband would have got it.
of course, your brother being Sir Leon yes, Britton, yes. Uh, former trade minister yes. and uh, European commissioner. Yes, correct. Sam, if you had to sum up and uh, give us a sense of how economic journalism has changed during your years at the Financial Times, what let, would you say? Let me give a cynical resume first, and then I might go back on it. It started off as a branch of writing about the stock market. I mean, in those, when I first started, city editors were mostly commentators on the market. The trick was to be very profound and pontifical, but yet not say anything that could be disproved about how shares were going to go. And this involved an economic, saying something about the economic background. And the economic background somehow jumped out and became a topic on its own. Sam, it's been a great pleasure, Samuel, I should say, yes. uh, a great pleasure. And you will be obviously continuing to contribute to the Financial Times. Yes. And we are all very grateful. And you thank you. Thank you very much. And you'll have to prod me to contributing. No prodding needed. Thank you, Sam. John Stuart Mill is a favorite author of mine. And you can see I've done the, and this is not, not this is, not actually by him, it's a, a sort of plug for him. But he died in about 1870, so it's, it's going far, quite far back. But I don't, I don't think that books written some time ago are just written by ancient people in funny clothes. I think they can still be interesting today. My favourite book, Essay on Liberty, because I believe it. It puts forward a very simple doctrine that people should be allowed to say or do what they like, so long as it doesn't interfere with others. It, this may sound obvious, but the number of people who follow this in practice are very few, is very small.